and welcome this morning at our session on the early Italian non-fiction film and the picturesque. And even if we're a small group, I assume that the best ones are sitting in this room. Um, I don't want to give um, uh, very lengthy uh, 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 introductions because you can read that in the program. Uh, my name is Ivo Blom, uh, Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. Uh, my two panel members are sitting in, almost in the middle, Sila Beruti and Luca Marseille, both from the Tor Vacata uh, University. Um, also, during my paper, I will refer a little bit also to their work. Okay, so there we go. Um, in her 2013 monograph, uh, Education in the School of Dreams, Jennifer Peterson uh, thoroughly analyzed the history and the genre of the early travel film explicitly linking it to the notion of the picturesque from the late 18th century uh, onwards. And partly, Paul, I'm also going to come back also to your speech in that sense uh, from yesterday. Scenic films appropriated picturesque representational strategies in two ways, by depicting picturesque subject matter, pastoral scenes, peasants, ruins, places familiar from picturesque tour itineraries, and by using picturesque compositional strategies such as side screens and composition and depth. But the films transform picturesque conventions by rendering them in a cinematic form, which means adding movements and the fragmentation of editing to an aesthetic that was previously quite static. The films also transformed the aesthetic institutionally. What once had been a style or a practice that supposedly marked those who appreciated as elite now became a sign of commercial value in a rapidly industrializing new media business. Well, the un underlinings here of the words are mine, but it's just to make it clear that these are key words that will come back in uh, my paper of today. And indeed, all these words of Patterson uh, come back when we research Italian early non-fiction film, the Dal Vero, as it's called, particularly the travel film. From the late tens to the mid-teens of the 20th century, Italy was one of the most active producers of travel films, and they were distributed, distributed all over the globe, valued in particular for their rare beauty, as reactions in the national, but also the international trade press confirm. Uh, deliberately, Italian cameramen such as Piero Marelli, and I'll come back to him today, reuse picturesque subject matter and compositional strat strategies, so the, two the two key terms from Patterson, to embellish their views and enchant their spectators. By the way, subjects and strategies that were often, uh, that often had their uh, preceding expressions in visual arts, both the professional art and amateur art, uh, and popular media, say, uh, chromolithography, stereo cards and postcards. And we'll see that today. On the other hand, the filmmakers also added typical cinematic elements such as movement, either within the mise-en-scene, uh, or by the camera, and often referring to means of transport. So how do we get to these idyllic places? <coughs> and also they added fragmentation of the image by editing, or sometimes, as we'll see, by ingenious split-screen effects. Um, while international uh, literature on early travel film uh, has gradually grown thanks to the eff effort of uh, uh, Jennifer Peterson and others, um, literature on Italian travel film has been scarce, although I will confess that I did some initial steps myself. Progress was made really in 2014 by a special issue of the film historical journal Imagine, co-edited by my partner in crime, my panel member Luca Mazzei, and an issue, by, in, uh, uh, by the way, in which my other panel member, Sila Beruti, also wrote an interesting article on the Italian travel film related to the 1912 Italo-Turkish War. And this research inspired Luca and me uh, to also present a slot on Italian early nonfiction last year, December 2018, at uh, a workshop at the I Film Museum in Amsterdam uh, called A Dive into the Collections of the I Film Museum, which I co-organized with Elif Rongen, head of the silent collections at I, and Céline Gailleur, Gailleur from Paris Oui, within the framework of an international research project in which we are still involved. Uh, despite fruitful discussions, we re realized more work needs to be done, both stylistically and contextually, and you'll hear that today as well. I will talk a lot about style, but the others will talk a lot about context. At least that's my assumption. 
Moreover, Italian foreign and foreign film archives have also given a lot more access than before uh, to their holdings um, lately, partly online and partly by use of DVDs. And um, one big uh, 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 stepping stone was that the Bologna archive issued in 2016 uh, a DVD with well, it, uh, 61 Italian non-fiction films from archives in and outside of Italy um, entitled Grand Tour Italiano and I use that a lot also for my paper of today. So I'll fo focus now first on the historiography uh, with Peterson as my main source and after which I'll discuss some Italian samples uh, with you. Um, in 1994, the I Film Museum organized a workshop nonfiction from the teens, and its discussions were published, but it also led to an additional publication, Uncharted Territory Essays on Early Nonfiction Film. And the workshop was a kind of Brighton conference, you could say, for early nonfiction. And the lack of literature, prints, uh, and access was acknowledged, of course, discussed, while well, after several viewings, first attempts to analyze these films were made. Um, Charles Musser, for instance, remarked the lack of uh, narrative in many of these early non-fiction films, but Tom Gunning uh, uh, responded uh, by warning against a dichotomy between, say, narrative and non-narrative, and proposing instead a rather spatial-based version versus a process or temporally-based early non-fiction film, stressing that several of the early travel films contain elements of both, even if the process-based versions seem to contain more narrative. Moreover, Gunning coined the term of view aesthetic, considering these films mime the act of uh, looking and observing. Um, in Un Uncharted Territory, Jennifer Peterson also published an article. Uh, she picked up this view aesthetic by Gunning uh, when talking about a travel gaze that, as she says, puts the stress on place and allows for subtler, subtler descriptions of appropriative gazes. Um, she links this to the Grand Tour tradition uh, and in general, as she says, the West's own mythologized past uh, and nostalgic rural landscape, end quote. Well, this works also for the mythology of types uh, linked in a film uh, often to the picturesque. According to uh, uh, Pedersen, after 1907, a development of non-fiction took place in which she writes, actors portrayed tourists as mediators for the audience's joy enjoyment of distant, distant places. The landscape itself, the view, was now more important than the experience of motion, end quote. And indeed, often the tourists we see in these films uh, function like a kind of stand-in for uh, as spectators and the phantom of uh, the phantom ride was not let's say the focus uh, anymore of these films even if they could be included um, Pedersen confronts uh, and I quote her landscape oriented travelogues so picturesque views uh, with people oriented travelogues um, uh, native types and she links this to landscape painting on the one hand and portraiture on the other hand um, which the travelogues often combine, by the way. Uh, often colors, such as uh, stencil coloring or combinations of uh, tinting and toning, monochrome coloring, enhance the picturesqueness of uh, the images. And often also the reality filmed is a mediated reality, filmed through a lens of, well, you could call it perhaps bourgeois aestheticism. Uh, Patterson also refers to Catherine Russell when discussing the openness in meaning uh, of early non-fiction film linked to Russell's term of textual openness. And in, the, in addition, early non-fiction film balances between the educational and the aesthetically uh, pleasing, between a world of the past and modernity, even if nostalgia and contemplation may be very dominant, and I would say especially this goes for the Italian films. In respect to the attention given to otherness, to far away, Patterson rightly indicates that these are relative concepts because for people with little means to travel, otherness may already start nearby. Um, and then when it would, while it would be one way to unmask these films as depoliticizing, masking conflicts, um, 
as Linda Nocklin has mentioned in, in regards to the con concept of the picturesque at large. Uh, Pedersen instead focuses on how early travel films use, and I quote, the picturesque as an idealized fiction of the represented uh, subject. Um, in Education in the School of Dreams, Patterson's monography, um, she indicates the theory of the picturesque started already in the late 18th century England, when Reverend William Gilpin, amateur artist himself, coined the picturesque, um, there may have been others, but I'm not going too deep into that, coined the picturesque with an aesthetic elitist appreciation related to the elitist tourism of the Grand Tour, taste and sensibility. Patterson also links this with Edmund Burke's 18, late 18th century elitist defense against the rise of the bourgeoisie and with his focus on the individual uh, sensation. The picturesque is then related to the representational, to likeness, to connoisseurship, to re reduplication of the landscape, uh, to singularity by repetition and to generic conventions. Um, with the picturesque, nature is looked upon pictorially as a series of pictures um, created to stimulate uh, automatic aesthetic uh, enjoyment, eventually turning it into a, a commodity. And the late 18th century picturesque favor of ruins, decay, uh, the past seen from the present transmutes, as Patterson says, real social conditions into aesthetic pleasantries. And therefore the elite looks to a kind of pre-modernity, you could say. Well, remnants of this, I'd say, return also in the early Italian early travel films. Moreover, Peterson notes the persistence of the picturesque during the 19th and early 20th century, a search for otherness from a Western perspective by use of various means, so tourism, uh, travel literature, professional landscape painting, but also amateur art. And the long-lasting tradition of Gilbin's techniques of the picturesque, uh, such as a predilection for side screens, uh, front screens, and the curves in a river to create depths, often return uh, into early travel film. And this also matches a long-lasting mutual exchange, you could say, uh, between tourism and aesthetics, and that even since the late 18th century. Even if, uh, by the 20th century, a bourgeois tourism, uh, not an aristocratic one, um, and rather armchair travel for the average filmgoer. Um, Pedersen points at the uh, importance of reproduction, like the proliferation of chromolithography prints card or, or cards of art, uh, which democratize art and uh, also had an important effect on early filmmakers like uh, Griffith. And then finally about the commodification of the picturesque uh, in the course of the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, she writes, over the course of decades, the picturesque became a popular style, a mass cultural shorthand for anything visually pleasing. Okay, unquote. But by the late 19th century, considered outmoded, even parodied very often, uh, but commercially very viable. Um, and perhaps right so, as Patterson suggests, because of the pleasure of the predictability in the picturesque. That's three P's. Okay. And this brings me to uh, the Italian travel film. Oh, sorry, I should have shown you this one. Oh, and um, Mark also the picture. It's rather an early parody, um, but look at the image and you probably will um, recognize the PIC and then the Turesk in the end. It's quite a funny thing. You can find it on the British Library uh, site. Doctor, the tour of Dr. Syntax in the search of the picturesque. Maybe Agnes, if you still need another title for your publication, that could be something. Um, right. Um, uh, the Italian travel films. Of course, these films are embedded within a larger context of rising tourism to Italy and a growing infrastructure. Uh, of course, the railway network uh, rapidly expanded in the, in the course of the 19th century. We have Thomas Cook, uh, which then was starting and booming with its travel agency, starting organized trips, introducing the traveler checks, uh, Baedeker guides, travel journals, art books. They all proliferate, proliferated in Italy and beyond, while the Dante Alighieri Society internationally promoted the Italian language and culture. <coughs> 
But what about the form and the style of these films? Uh, when we deal with subject matter and compositional strategies, uh, the two Patterson keywords, um, we may recall Irina Rajevsky's concept of intermedial references, in particular her subcategory of system references, referring to a medial subsystem or even a medium qua system. <coughs> also, because of the fluidity and the unclarity when uh, co compositional uh, work uh, compositional strategies come from, uh, then Jens Schreuter's concept of formal or transmedial intermediality is also apt. Uh, a concept based on uh, formal structures, not specific to one medium, but found in uh, different media. And we may even relate it to Catherine Russell's concept of parallax historiography as the, let, the later medium of cinema uh, appropriates conventions from previous media, both acclaimed arts, but also their proliferation, their appropriations by popular media. And by this act, uh, early cinema also calls for a reinterpretation and a rewrite of the history of the previous media. Um, first of all, we may uh, look at Gilpin's late 18th century techniques of the side screens of trees, which you can see here, for instance, and the creation of depths by rivers that are sinuously displayed before our, our eyes as a kind of crawling serpents. Um, that was, of course, not an invention of his, uh, as we already may trace in the classical painting by Peter Bruegel as this landscape uh, with a flight into Egypt. But um, the same setup you can also recognize in early Italian travel films, like here Trento e Dintorni, for which title and year are insured, I'm not going into details, but for sure filmed by Piero Marelli. Um, when we think of painting and its derivates in uh, postcards as the model for idyllic images, then we may compare, for instance, uh, the sunset in Sulago di Como with a postcard uh, depicting a similar scene. Actually, it's not entirely clear if the postcard predates the film. Uh, um, it's much di more difficult to date cards than films, I have the impression. Or take here the backlight on Venice created by a setting sun compared to a late 19th century uh, similar scene um, by uh, Oswald Aschenbach. Or take the shepherd boy's motive uh, for sunset scenes as here on the left in Trento e Dintorni by Marelli um, compared to Giovanni Segantini's quite famous Ave Maria a Trasbordo from the 1880s. Um, the Italian travel films often use all kinds of framing to mark the stage construction of the picture scene, uh, a kind of uh, front screens from the stage, if you like, by use of natural arches, such as those of bridges, uh, um, uh, town gate porches, etc. Uh, comparable to Spreewald over by Stralau by uh, Schinkel, as you can see. But what they also often contain are all kinds of different uh, 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 masks, uh, artificial masks, um, for which, for instance, the oval format you could relate to Gilpin and other classical samples from uh, painting. But some of the shapes of these masks, like the diamond one, for instance, I have no pictorial equivalent for this. So uh, I could well imagine that people were really experimenting uh, at the time with these kinds of masks as well. Moreover, also new is the mask imitating binoculars, sometimes matched also with shots of a stand in, uh, using these binoculars and explaining the strange masks, such as here in Un Giorno a Palermo, in which a well-dressed lady stares our gaze. And the concept of exhortatio from art history comes to mind. The figure on screen demonstrates how we should behave and react to the shown spectacle. Um, the image may be fragmented, as here in Sestri Lavante, comparable to fragmentation of images on postcards. And actually, I wouldn't be surprised if the fragmentation on postcards, nowadays very popular, of course, starts in film before its cliché on postcard structures. So it's not always that postcards is the first model and then, comes, uh, then film comes afterwards. <coughs> 
And that also concerns for the overabundance of the sunset as the finale of many Italian travel films, which also seem to precede the popularity of the motive on cards. Instead, opening shots of Italian travel films may be extreme long shots of city views uh, or coastlines, giving the spectator a kind of uh, 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 full overview, often increased by the panning camera. Then again, many other Dal Vero films, both within and outside of Italy, lack this, which then confirms the irregularity of the, the genre and its openness in style and structure. A particular kind of um, um, fragmentation is the split-screen effect uh, we encounter in films by cameraman Piero Marelli, who first worked for Pasquale and afterwards on, uh, for Ambrosio. And he also shot many travel films, not only in Italy, but also outside, especially in Northern Europe. The split screen always shows one shot using mobile framing, so shot from a boat, from a tree, so uh, more, uh, more a natural kind of uh, uh, mobile frame, you could say, combined with a shot with a fixed camera recording motion rather on screen. So there's this juxtaposition. Um, Marelli's split screens were purely cinematic. They marked the experiment in travel film. And as his films were later re edited and re released, it's um, quite difficult to identify them, um, at least for the prints that we have found. But the split screens are definitely his trademark. We haven't found them in other films. So it's also a way to, to identify his films. Um, and then content-wise, I'd like to mention two popular mot motives with pictorial roots, which often recur in the Italian Del Vero. First of all, it's a classic motive, that of the washerwomen, the lavandaie, during the laundry on the riverside, as here in the Piombino at Porto Ferraio, uh, Palou de Pontina and Sestri Levante. Um, when talking about pre-modernity, nostalgia, embellished image of the working class, this motive is a classic. It's causing a proliferation uh, of images on postcards, on stereo cards, but also in naturalistic painting, both within and outside of Italy, as you can see here with Boudin and Tomasi. Um, but there are even the unrealistic, romanticized, or the very expressionist, colorful versions, uh, Boucher on the left and my compatriot Van Gogh on the right side. Um, another key motive is that of the modern train uh, crossing the landscape or the nostalgic cityscape. In Attraverso la Sicilia, a film possibly by Marelli, the film imitates train travel st st uh, starting with its landing from the ferry to images of the fast-moving vehicle cutting through the landscape and the archaic countryside. Um, also, in other Italian travel films, the moving and puffing train and its necessities, such as uh, uh, new train bridges overspanning great depths, uh, give a typical cinematic excitement and, and, and confirm modernity. But they also have their roots in 19th century painting, as this painting on the left by Giuseppe De Nitis, for instance, Passa il Treno, in which the steam of the train creates a giant diagonal circulation over the canvas. And here you also have some postcard samples. In conclusion, uh, we notice both in content and style how Italian travel films hark back to motives and compositional strategies familiar with painting and the picturesque, but also contain modern elements typical for cinema as a new and modern medium, uh, paralleling modernity also outside of the screen, you could say. And this in a young nation eager to show the world its ancient culture, its natural scenery, its traditional culture and folklore, its roots, you could also say, but also by use of modern mean means such as the train, the car, and of course the camera. And at times also linking the picturesque landscapes um, with modernity on view, such as the recurring motives of uh, hydropower stations, when we're talking about rivers, or, or the new tunnels and bridges serving the modern means of transport. And of course, Italian Del Vero films mask certain <coughs> issues of social conflict, uh, which authors like Aldo Bernardini have uh, uh, also indicated, and therefore lacks in content and style may be indicative. But, as Peterson pleads, let's first analyze what we do see, 
And where this comes from, including the craving for the picturesque and, as she writes, the idealized fiction of the represented subject. Thank you.